kill you. Welcome back to Zaku Talk this season, G vs. Wing, and we're doing episode two of each of these series today. I am your host, Patrick Scale, and with me, as always, is... Bob Scary, voiceover artist. All right, Bob, how has your week been? What's been going on with you? Uh, week's been okay. Uh, once again, uh, it's been hard to get behind the mic. I've been getting more stuff done with uh, audio stuff and uh, doing research things like that uh but i did have a lot of really good talks towards the latter part of the week that helped me to continue to put things into perspective and uh between you and other folk i i'm probably gonna get behind the mic as early as sunday if not monday very Uh, cool so yeah uh but uh other than that i have been talking with individuals all across uh twitter and the like about uh role-playing games about uh, various shows that have been going on. And of course, I've been talking about uh, how weird the name Chibity Crockett is. <laughs> yes, we'll get to that when we get to the recaps. I yeah. have a lot of I have a lot of questions about that for you. I have no answers. <laughs> Spoiler <so>. alert. <laughs> uh, my week has been all right. I'm getting ready to, you know, we're starting, we're probably going to move into production on this animated project. I, I've been prepping for a while uh, in a couple months uh so i've had to learn i've been navigating my way around unreal engine which for any filmmakers out there just sort of letting you know is it's going to be a big boom of that in the film industry in the next three to five years maybe even a little earlier so get ready for that try to learn what you can you don't have to learn c plus plus to take full effect of it i currently am i made some fun coding jokes that no one uh who doesn't both know coding and Latin will get with my fellow Latin scholar, coder friend, Mr. Paul Jeremini, a uh, frequent guest on my pre- other podcast, What the Hell Happened to Them, Adam Sandler Saga. Um, but also, for you Gundam nerds there, my compiler is read uh, in a very char type fashion, so it is now three t- and now compiles code three times faster than a normal compiler. Um, nothing new, sort of nothing else sort of exciting beyond that, finishing up some older projects, doing some writing on some things and whatnot. All right, Bob, why don't you give us the recap of G Gundam episode two? All right. Well, uh, of course I didn't write down the title of the episode in front of me, but, uh, the gist is as such. Uh, well, we first, get, let me just say, uh, I don't blame you for not writing it down because, uh, G Gundam's titles have been so long uh so far and i i I wonder why but go on uh well uh we'll we'll certainly get to talking about that (laughs) i'll i'll pull up the title and tell you the title at the end of my little bit that sounds good um but yes so uh we start with getting a recap of this world from the uh I want to keep calling him the narrator, but I believe he does have a name in canon. Uh, this individual starts off with uh, a nod to Rocky Horror Picture Show's narration, uh, then goes on to, you know, let us know what's happening. People have turned war into something that includes sports, sportsmanship. Uh, we find uh, Domon in New York City on Earth, uh, and he's trying to see about uh, challenging Neo America's Gundam pilot, or rather Gundam Fighter per this series, Chibity Crockett. America! Fuck yeah! As alluded to just a bit earlier, uh, his full name is actually Chibity David Crockett, so that <laughs> at least explains the latter part of his name. Did they, did they say that in this episode? I don't remember that. Not in this episode, uh, okay, no, okay. but I was uh, I was doing a sift knowing that we were going into this. Yeah, okay, just so. checking. Uh, but... Uh, so we we find out that uh, Chibity is uh, the hero of all New York City, as well as those who wish to find their way up to Neo America. 
Uh, we see that he is uh, attempting to just fight for the dreams of everybody while uh, some New American uh, stooges are trying to control him so that they can get an opportunity to fly up there too. They think he's a dipshit, but hey, he, uh, he punched good. He and his four ladies, who are also his uh, side uh, folk, the people that help to manage his machine and keep him up to snuff. His pit crew. Uh, his pit crew, effectively, yes. Uh, but they are four lovely ladies of varying hair colors and skin colors to help you know that, yeah, he's got a good situation going on. Uh, Domo and Kashu knocks a man out in uh, a challenger's room where uh, that individual plus uh, Chibity are going to try and fight. Uh, he sucker punches Chibity and challenges him to a Gundam match before running away, uh, but not without getting uh, scathed across the side by one punch. Uh, one punch! Uh, and it really does goof him up some. Uh, we get a little more uh, information as that part goes off into uh, what seems to be the relationship between Rain and uh, Domon. And that's only going to further develop after we get through this first five episode cycle. Uh, Domon and Rain get a message from one of the uh, pit crew girls who was captured and made hostage by the Stooges, uh, who tell him to go to Broadway, a complete deserted area, uh, while he's uh, while Chibity's waiting over in Broadway, uh, not Broadway, Brooklyn Stadium. Chibity comes in to save Domon from being annihilated by these two jerks. Uh, and then after taking out the two guys and, uh, as far as I know, killing them inside their suits, uh, they proceed to have one of the quickest matches you will probably see in the series. Uh, Domon breaks the arm, the right arm of the Gundam Maxter after seeing that it is a boxer, football player, surfer robot uh because that's america right <laughs> circa 1994 it's such a complicated mech i love it, it does though. so many weird things its shoulder pads <laughs> become its boxing gloves but it already had bo- it had like brass knuckles already and then it well yeah those are just little like gloves. those are early day boxing <laughs> gloves when they were like really tight to your it fist. needed two different sets of boxing gloves built in it's crazy <laughs> It's so good, but eventually, <laughs> uh, after breaking Gundam Maxter's right arm, uh, and uh, I guess Chibity had to feel it some because of the way that the suits on the inside work, uh, he spared, uh, rather, Domon spared Chibity by not crushing the head of Gundam Maxter, allowing him to continue to uh, challenge and rise up towards the championship matches, and calls him one of the nice guys. Uh, we got the translation good guy, but uh, they absolutely, in the Japanese, called him a nice guy. Yeah, I was going to ask and, you about that. I'm glad you brought that up. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we go off and follow Domon into the sunset, going off to the next area that he has to go fight. Yeah, it's uh, interesting that when uh, you know the American guy's hand arm gets destroyed, he feels it. But when the Italian guy's head gets destroyed, he does not. Because he's not wearing a thing on his head. Ah, uh, okay. All right. Right? The only thing that is not covered in that suit yeah. is the head area, for that very reason. <laughs> okay. So, uh, great recap, Bob. Thank you. So, in Wing, uh, what happens is we see he- Hero sort of playing around at school, doing some secret agent-y things. Uh, he has to sort of kind of complete his assimilation into the school and gather information on where his Gundam may have landed and how to find a way to destroy it so that Oz can't get its hands on it, which they're trying to do. Zex and an alliance ship uh, getting sort of a, a pissing contest f- for for seemingly no reason uh, with sort of the, the naval officer saying, damn you, Zex, which felt extremely unmotivated in my mind and always has every time I've watched it. Anyway, Zex gets close. His minion from the first episode goes and has his own little episode as he kind of tracks it down, but the Death Scythe Gundam sort of makes quick work of them and wants to salvage it for parts of his, for his own. Uh, Relina, meanwhile, has her birthday party. Uh, it seems very sad that Hero doesn't show up, and when she gets a clue at where he might be, she goes rushing off in the middle of it to find him. Uh, as he's about to do something uh, to silence her, Duo comes to shoot 
Hero, uh, but Hero still successfully manages to destroy his Gundam uh, desp- and possibly the Death Sight Gundam despite a couple of bullet wounds before he passes out into the sea um, and, and seemingly floats. So, uh, you know, again, a, more, a very expositional kind of thing, but um, sort of starts to introduce I, us to the that, other You say that, but pilots. it says so much about... I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. No, yeah, it says so much about these pilots, and what I like that this show does that I think the the opening theme images kind of ruin now that we're sort of into our story beat section is uh, like I, it would have been nice if we didn't know duo was going to be a bigger character in the series or was going to be part of the the team quote unquote, because then we'd sort of be like, what is this guy up to? And we'd see these other pilots in passing. We wouldn't be certain what their motivations are other than maybe Catra's the blonde ones. Um, And you could have had a lot of intrigue and, um, or what do I want to call it? Sort of like suspense there. And I guess, uh, you know, sort of a big thing I want to talk about in both of these episodes is a, a thing I've always sort of referred to as information dissemination, sort of what mm. you say when, what you reveal when. Um, because, uh, you know, it sort of came to my mind as the narrator guy was sort of opening up the G Gundam episode um, and then sort of seeing Duo and imagining like, hmm, if I didn't know who Duo was and I didn't know he was going to be a main character, what would I think of this situation? How would that affect the irony of him thinking that Hero's the bad guy, which makes him think he's the good guy? How would that affect sort of st- more strongly the themes in here if we didn't know that, you know, um, in an Avengers-like style that these guys were going to maybe team up at some point? And it's sort of one of the things that I think hurts a lot of the newer viewers that since the movie Avengers came out is they're sort of mad that these people aren't teamed up right away and don't really team up and fully until the very end of the series uh, where they seem to kind of expect and want that kind of super powered team going. So, um, so Bob, for you as a, as a longtime G Gundam fan and me quickly finding out how little memory of G Gundam I have in my head does sort of this narrator coming out instantly giving out this information at the beginning, does that help or hurt the series? Would it have been better if we got it in the first episode? Would it have been better if we sort of got parsed out over another episodes more organically? What are sort of your thoughts on that? So my feeling is that the narrator does exactly what he needs to do, which is to create the hype as you go into the episode while making sure that all of the parts that they don't want to be um, what is the word I want to hear have here? Um, I I think they are trying to avoid having too much of that information dissemination as part of story, too much of that expositional plot being uh, read out to them in the characters' voices. By having it all at the front, it makes it a lot easier to just digest the scenes that are coming along, especially where this is such a um, motif-driven and uh, theme-driven series. Uh, it wants you to not worry about the big external stuff yet. The big external stuff happens as a part of a growth. Uh, We start with just seeing, okay, Domon comes to uh, the earth. He's looking for a guy. That's all you need to care about right now. All the stuff that's happening with the Neo uh, colonies and everything, that's happening overhead. That'll be more important later. But for now, zero in. I think that makes it a lot easier to look at this in the same way as a lot of the uh, martial arts shonen style series that were very popular at the time. And it does uh, seem to mash up really well with not just the uh, aforementioned tokusatsu stuff that I also am a big longtime fan of, but this is not uncommon for some storytelling pieces that are done in that time of Japan Um, or more accurately, uh, older, older series would have something of a uh, Rod Serling type. Uh, I know at the very least, uh, again, to suck on the teat of Super Sentai, uh, Kaku Ranger, uh, a ninja series, had a gentleman at the beginning of each episode and interspersed throughout the episode, just kneeling in front of a microphone, dictating some of the story to you. And he's supposed to be sort of a uh, comedic relief. In a similar way, our narrator in G Gundam is sitting there trying to be a gentleman, a man of distinction, to tell you what is going on in this world. But when it's time, he removes his guys. Gundam fight set, ready, go! 
it's supposed to get you ready for here's where the hits happen. Here's where the energy gets pumped up as opposed to intrigue and subplot and everything that's going on over there on Gundam Wang. Oh, yeah, it just it, sort of, it felt odd to me because it, it's uh, but maybe part of this was that I sort of know the show already. It felt like mm-hmm. we got a lot of this information already last episode, but then you could sort of chalk it up to sort of like a little recap or a summary in case, you know, you missed the first episode or, or you've forgotten what's happened already or you didn't pick up on all the clues. In uh, terms of wing? No, in terms of G Gundam. Okay. It's, you know, but again, a lot of it might just be like, I already know it anyway. So it feels like I'm hearing it again. Um, mm. But it felt like they were sort of talking a lot about the Gundam battle and why they happen. And it's annoying that they're happening on Earth. They're uh, trying in that to... first episode already. So um, the they're other weird trying thing, to set those yeah. things up. Well, yes, but it, but it, I don't know. I guess like that information is already there and now we're getting it again. It it's odd. not about the information. It's <laughs> about the setting up of what the emotions might be each time yeah. that we see the narrator. He will reference this for the first while. So be prepared in episodes three, four, and five that there will be at least some acknowledgement of this story. It is a common thing, uh, at least from my understanding of certain shonen and certain shows in, of this same nature, that they want to repeat the beginning a few times to make sure it sets in with the audience who are still coming at this brand new yes. at their time. And it's generally aimed at a younger audience. So to remind them of the big thing while they focus on the small thing. Uh, again, a lot of the shows like Rider, Sentai, what have you, they will have a lead in during their opening sequence Mm -hmm. that says it really briefly before the theme song that just lets you know what the standing is at this moment. And then as arcs change, they will change that lead in because it's letting you understand what is the overall premise of this part of the story. Okay. And the other weird thing about it was... Uh, does Domon jump the shark of the show by asking the narrator if he's seen the man in the photo already here in episode two? No, because it's not Domon Domon. As we see him standing in space in front of a uh, the earth, we can understand that this is just us getting a taste of this individual. It's supposed to be not imposing on the narrator, but on us. We're still seeing Domon as this uh, dark character, this tragic hero type. So we're just supposed to understand, I'm dark, I'm brooding. I don't care about anything or anyone. I just need to find this man. But but I I do comically bring up at at inappropriate moments uh, the photo, including here in this opening narration. Oh, yeah. No, I said that to my wife. Like we, She's decided that she's going to watch these episodes with me because she never yeah. got to watch Wing, sure. even though she loves it. Yeah, that's good. And I've told her to watch G. Yeah. But right there in the boxing ring, he could have been like, have you seen this man? No? Okay. Stuff. Gundam match. Easy as that. Not, hey, I'm going to break your arm. But before I do that, Seen this guy? Yeah, it, it, no? it's it's wow. crazy. <laughs> it's, it's it's only been two episodes so far, but he's done it like three or four times, and it always surprises me. Like, why did you pick now? And I would have bought the boxing match more, or why yeah. he needed to go into it if he was just like, "All right, I got your attention now. Have you seen this man?" Instead of like, now, "All right, I've got your attention now. You have to challenge me." But maybe I don't know the rules. Even if he just winds up, goes up to him and challenges him, does Chibity have to then? say like accept it like how does this work at this stage of the gundam fight at this stage of the gundam fight uh at least as far as uh, i'm trying to slow myself down and not watch ahead yes at this point in the show one assumes that it's because of a fighter's pride a man's pride so on and so forth if you refuse it you are showing your weakness and there there is some limit of you have to be able to defeat a certain number of individuals to rise in the rankings to eventually get to the semifinals and finals. Okay. Yeah. It was just sort of like, like why, why did he, why he could have just come to New York in the gun and been like an a loudspeaker. I challenge America's fighter. But he said, instead decided to hide the Gundam in the Statue of Liberty, then punch out one guy, take his place, sucker punch another guy, and then challenge him to a Gundam fight that way. It just it was a lot of work. And if he, we sort he's of sk- also in his early twenties, I know. You, what? Well, that's you remember our friends in our early twenties, yes, and it's fine. It's just it's sort of interesting that 
in this show that ostensibly wants Domon to be its protagonist, that he's like a huge dick. And, and yeah, and but <laughs> it's sort of funny that we're we're like cheering him on as he beats up these other guys. But he's just a big dick so far. You I, say <laughs> as uh, and I'm going to use this as a pivoting point yeah. uh, because I will note that uh, they're trying to set up Domo for a lot of character development sure, sure. by making him a dick in this first set of five episodes. But yeah. Domo is nothing if not believable compared to Hiro Yui, who is just like, I'm good at everything. I'm also going to climb the side of this building. I'm just going to talk to myself as I uh, take care of my financial situation. And any chance I get, I'm either going to kill or be killed because that means I've completed the mission. I've done good job. Well, that Daddy, love me. Yeah, yeah, that I don't mind because two reasons. One, I, there's, there is a thing I mind and I'll get to in a moment. But mm-hmm. most of it I don't mind because of, of stuff, you know, like you said, stuff we're, about Domo and stuff we're going to find out soon. Um and um, the talking to himself is, is sort of what annoys me about anime in general. But I I think they do it because there's sort of a I don't know there's a lack of information. Live action does the same damn thing. A lot of, it, a lot of, a lot of information in the nineties. Uh, you know, it seems to be a, the Japanese in general seem to enjoy doing it, and I'm not sure why. I get it in animation because there's less you can convey in a face. Um, yeah. So somewhat I buy it. Um, but like there's a there's a there's, there's a distinction, you know, I think more people could be like, ah, oh, Hero's cool because he can do everything. And so they kind of buy into that, even though my conspiracy theory is Raleen is the protagonist um, mm-hmm. versus Domon, who's just sort of like a big. So it's just it's, it, it seems to work because the show is wildly popular. It's just an interesting strategy to take where you make your character extremely unlikable and confuse other people and confuse the audience as to why other people like him. Um, mm-hmm. My problem with Hero, this, you know, isn't him being good. It's that for he clearly cares about secrecy, but shows off every chance he can get. He has no desire to not show off that he could be a secret agent by being good at everything, riding his horse very effectively. He didn't need to ride the horse to the side of that building to climb up. He, he could have just walked there, secretly ditched out on class. People think he's a stoner or whatever. And he doesn't need to yeah. be like really good at fencing. It just it felt like he wanted to prove a point to that preppy kid. So yes. like, like that's sort of, you know, what I don't, that's sort of a moment where I was like, "Why would he do that?" But everything else, I, I, I I'm okay with based on how the the show sort is of the goes white horse there. symbolism. Ah, uh, that's interesting. There is actually sort of so Relina kind of brings up this little prince quote, and and my first yeah. thought was it, it feels like anime references that book a lot. But then then I as I tried to look back in my mind, I couldn't remember other anime that does it, but I feel like they do. I can't prove it. So ignore me on that point. But it's actually a reference to something um, where in, in the prequel that we won't see in the show, but in the in the, the manga adaptation and in the prequel manga that, that came out immediately after the show uh, does where in her childhood, she actually runs across uh, Zex Marquis, the man in the mask in her childhood and he sort of refers to himself as sort of a prince of the stars like a little prince kind of character so she Mm -hmm. in her mind she's sort of equating those two figures um and being surprised by it Mm. Uh, okay so we let's let's talk about uh chibity crockett and why his name is so weird yes bob why is his name so weird well i can tell you the obvious which is the last name is to make sure he sound american with Davy Crockett. So Davy Crockett, I kind of buy. What is this chippity thing? What is going on there? Future naming convention. <laughs> that literally, I intentionally went through as yeah. many websites as I could find looking for chippity name origin, chippity name meaning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and nothing now. And I think the best way to sum it up is based on, uh, one of the links I clicked was a post on a forum back in 2014 that basically read it's G Gundam (laughs) and that's it. (laughs) Like truly there are going to be a lot of names that are going to be weird. uh, And generally it'll either be the last name more likely than the first name. If not both mean something or nothing. (laughs) <laughs> and it's it's really that binary. Um, okay. I know that there is uh, spoilers. 
There is a uh, character that will show up for an episode, maybe two, towards the very end during the the big arena fights for the semifinals. And uh, his last name is Cronus. His Mm -hmm. first name is a thing. It doesn't seem to be a name of any kind in reality. Yeah. Uh, But he pilots the Zeus Gundam, Uh, uh, I believe. So that's why it's interesting that he is within that. Okay. So, uh, I kind of get sort of his thing. I get, you know, everything about him sort of makes sense except for everything about him sort of makes sense about how Americans would be viewed by people outside of us. Um, except, uh, the hair color. Is this just sort of generic anime hair? Is there a reason why it's sort of pinkish purple kind of thing? Or, uh, is it just, was just like, so you could distinguish him from other people? Uh, it's probably the latter again <laughs> in the in the 90s as many people of our age group who were trying to read the how to draw manga and animu <laughs> yeah. uh they i distinctly remember a book that i read when i was in high school that tried to dictate hair color equals vibe okay uh, so like having white hair meant that you were spooky and <laughs> weird and mystic versus having dark blair black hair was which was like dark and brooding mm-hmm. and uh distant uh and each of these colors meant something different based on just generic archetypes in the case of something like g gundam yeah i think a lot of it is just he has blue hair the pink strip that happens in the front of his head is something later so that might be dyed yeah, I like but that. I like that when he's natural. a child, it's only blue, and then he's old. He's got a small tuft of pink, and I'm thinking, like, does that mean that pink hair in anime is equivalent to like graying hair? That's a that's an interesting take, right? Because then I thought to the there's the there's the scientist in uh, Tenchi, and she has pink hair, but she's supposed to be like 500 years old. She's also an alien, so they're all aliens. But that's my point. They're all like, aliens. Yeah, that's interesting that only the aliens have the weird hair color. Ah. And then and then the only other one I could think of was there's somebody in Gundam Seed, and she has pink hair, but she is not old. She's just meant to look, I don't know, fan servicey or something maybe. I don't know. Not a fan. I, I do think that it is simply a signifier. The yeah. color of the hair is just meant to try and draw you to them as opposed to having your standardized hair colors because those characters tend to be less uh important to storylines even if they do have a normal hair color generally if they have a transformation oftentimes their hair color will change in the transformation or it will complement whatever color uh their clothing happens to have i am grateful that anime does that because especially in a show like gundam but really mostly in general it does help me personally tell people apart uh because i don't know why i have a hard time with that even in, in movies uh, that are live action in in my own country. I have a difficult time. So anytime they can do something to give something something give somebody something very distinguishing, it's all. I'm always very grateful for it. Yes. Um, uh, so yes. now my my question to you. Mm-hmm. Um, why does Hiro Yui want to die? He he actively throws himself off the boat at the end to go face down. He doesn't do what any other kid might do. Uh, which is, you know, try to find a way to stab, shoot, whatever themselves. He doesn't actively act on it, but he does stay face down in the water. And unless we're trying to go with anime time, meaning nothing, uh, he's face down for at least a solid minute in the water. He's He's got to be brain damaged. I yes. know he's not. Yes, but. unfortunately, yeah, it sort of goes by anime logic. I think they wanted to sort of end on a cliffhanger. Um, and make us really think that that guy was dead, which again, could have been a cool thing if he wasn't prominently featured in the opening sequence. Cause then we might think he's just not an important character at all. And now Relina yeah. or Duo is going to take over this thing and, and, and go on an adventure that way. Um, so, you know, that's sort of where maybe kind of holding back more might've been helpful. There's sort of two, th- I, I, Relina has sort of, you know, an ambiguous thing I want to talk about too. But for Hero, it could be two things. It could be this backstory that I don't want to tell you yet, but it does sort of no, tie into you. the teddy bear in the opening sequence that we don't find out about until the movie. Mm. Um, so where it, it's sort of like this death wish he seems to have. But it could also be sort of like he feels that he failed. He got that. He, he was sent down to Earth to do something. He got caught. The machine's been caught. He feels like he's a failure. So his neck, his 
backup mission, if he wasn't able to succeed with the first mission, is to self-destruct the Gundam and destroy himself to keep sort of things from tracing back to the colony that he left from to keep uh, any, any revenge from the alliance happening. I'm going to follow that up yes. with why is Relina's dad so dumb? <laughs> like why he takes he forever to get, yeah. get those pictures picked up, giving Relina more than enough time to see the shooting stars of which they both saw out the window and the space shuttle down to earth yeah. and even uttered aloud in a well sat uh, space, almost like an airplane project meteor. Like, okay. You didn't have to say it out loud, especially right into your daughter's ear. Like, he's bad at his job. Am I wrong in believing Yeah, I, I, again, this is sort of what annoys me about, you know, anime is just this over-exposition. Um, you know, especially since I don't know why people can't think things. Um, and Relina will sort of never kind of interact fully with Operation Meteor by name. So she never she never really needed to know. So it's purely for us. So I don't know, especially having just watched <laughs> David Lynch's Doom movie last week, why it can't be in his head, which other characters have done in the show. Or if they haven't yet, they will. So just do it that way. I don't understand why you would do it there. Um, Folks. <laughs> I'm going to actually stop Skate Hill here because yeah. uh, I am remembering a film that he and I both watched years ago, Adaptation. And yes. uh, one of the things that they try to make sure is a uh, show don't tell situation. Uh, now, while I will say that, yes, they don't need to say things out loud, I think it would be worse if we had just us watching a person and hearing a voiceover. That would seem lazier. and while I do have some qualms with people soliloquying all over the place, soliloquizing, what, however the word would go. doesn't matter. The soliloquy at least gives us more action and visible concern on their part. Later anime, like post-2000 anime, we start seeing more internal monologuing, uh, more so than in the 90s and 80s. But it's more so because at least when you watch a dub, they're trying to fill plenty of spaces when we have the, the still moments. So we actually get more internal monologue here in the States than we might in Japan. So I'll actually disagree with you there. I don't think there's any extra dramatizing. And I think at least in this instance where he's either he's, we're on a close up of him, as he says, operation meteor, or we could just be on the close up of him and he thinks operation meteor. And the only thing that's really changed is his mouth doesn't animate. Um, and it, it just and then it, we don't have to think like, why would he say that aloud in front of his daughter? And um, and, and I don't know, again, this could be an issue of sort of facial expressions, but either way in his head or saying it aloud, we're still getting most of the information from his voice more than anything else that he himself is doing. And, it, you know, this is going to sound weird because we're watching anime, but it helps it feel less cartoony to me as a viewer here. Um, and, and we're going to get in sort of a whole thing later on when everybody's sort of having these long sort of therapeutic dialogues with each other as they do battles in Gundam where we're going to be like, why? This is not the time for this. But, uh, you know, we can complain about that later. It just seems to be sort of a genre staple at this point since the sure. first Gundam. Um, but that's sort of my thought on that there. The yeah, so uh, Dorland's an interesting character. Even in the prologue stuff, we don't get to learn too much about him, other than that, yes, he did know about Operation Meteor pretty early, um, and that Hero actually had an opportunity to kill him as one of his earlier missions and chose not to do it. We don't learn this in the show, but um, right before he goes to Earth and they return to Earth, his mission was to shoot uh, the minister. Um, and he, and, and, and maybe his daughter that I don't specifically remember, but definitely Dorland and he chooses not to do it. Hmm. So that's sort of interesting. interesting. So what Relina sort of kind of, she, she leaves her. So it's weird. So, so all of Relina's classmates are way too into her for reasons yeah. I, they never really go into. I don't know why. No, they say it literally in the first episode. What do they say? She's rich. She's smart. She's pretty. Yeah, but aren't she's they, perfect. Aren't they all she's that? everything. Like, what, uh, what, what, they're, all, they're all in this school, so they're all rich, and they're all from these well-to-do families. So what makes her so different than them? 
I don't, I don't because know. Uh, it's creme de la creme. It's the tip of the top. Everybody seems to look at her, and especially because she's muting herself for the sake of pleasing others, people look at that and go, oh, she's awesome because she's everything I want her to be. Yeah, it just feels weird. Like, what are these What are, What are these kids' parents do if the, if the person they look up to is just the daughter of a guy who works for the Secretary of State? Like, it's this odd kind of uh politics is and, and, power man yeah but like none of that none of them are are like also in the alliance and like in a better position it's just sort of <laughs> it's just sort of quick so they're obsessed with her and, and they gossip like all the time and i don't remember yeah. this being a big part of my high school experience i don't know if yours was different uh I, um it just seems this school seems very gossip tv in general schools seem very gossipy was did you have a lot of that when you were in high school bob did you see that uh, you know, actually, I did. And it's it's dependent on what social circles you find yourself in. If okay. you always stay insular, it's not a whole lot. But if you are bouncing between different groups, you see it left and right, especially when you start getting into the upper echelons of stupid teenage cliques. OK, uh, the higher up you go on the ranks, the more likely there's going to be rumoring and gossiping. So it's interesting to see, you know, the way that they're these girls and, and the other the, even the boy classmates are, are sort of obsessed with Relina. Relina also weirdly obsessed with Hero. And there's sort of an interesting ambiguity to it because I've, I don't know, maybe I've watched the show 10 times by now over the last, you know, 20, 19 years. Um and so I want, you know, every time I watch it, I go back and forth. I wonder, is she sort of just like this disaffected youth trying to stave off boredom with this kind of what she perceives to be a call to adventure? Uh, is it sort of like just an upper class teen who has these delusions of grandeur that she can kind of be a part of whatever hero is doing or try to stop him from killing people? Um, or is it does it sort of tie back into this memory that nobody would have yet watching the show? But if they read the manga afterwards, would kind of get it of like this sort of chance encounter she had and she's trying to kind of relive the, the magic of that evening. Um, but I like, I guess this is sort of a moment where I like that they don't kind of explain it and you can kind of, it feels odd, um, especially for episode two. And if you haven't seen where it goes from here, you're like, what the fuck is this girl's problem? And I could see why people don't like her later on. And they sort of just calcify that opinion and don't let it change as she changes. But it was sort of all interesting to note as I watched it this time, kind of juggling those three in my mind. And there might even be more that I'm not even considering. So, I mean, uh, from my perspective, the, the instant that this all happened where she started to be fascinated with him is that this is a person who is talking to her like a person and not as a, uh, uh, some greater abstract version of herself. Mm, yeah, and that's a good point. even though she's receiving these death threats and everything, she sees something in him that uh, is lying mm -hmm. to himself somehow or another and trying to figure out the puzzle that is this weird kid that tried to kill himself is something that she wants to figure out. You yeah, know, I, tack on your, your space yeah. prince thing. You know, she, she literally sees a shooting star, goes to Earth, and gets to see a boy who threatens to kill her because he's doing some important work. That has shoujo written all over it. Yeah, I just I like I like your take on on sort of him treating her normalish compared to everybody else um, as she tries to sort of break away, you know, as a t typical teen rebellion kind of thing. So that's that's an interesting approach to it I hadn't considered. Mm. So that's pretty cool. There's also sort of something interesting here in the in the Zex part of the plot where this character sort of did a bunch of stuff or said a bunch of stuff in the first episode um, and then sort of leads the team, asks Zex for him to lead the team to go find the Gundam underwater and even thinks he defeated the Death Scythe Gundam. I think it's sort of an interesting thing the show does where all these sort of extras that don't always even get names kind of have little things to themselves and there's like a continuity between them. Like both those pilots in that first episode, this guy dies pretty quickly, but the other guy sticks around for a while and he sort of continues to do more too. Like these characters mattered, even though, you know, in, in a grander scheme, they don't and they'd be like 19th on the call sheet or something. And there's sort of an important theme behind that these kind of nameless characters being important and having moments to themselves to showcase kind of this bigger world and kind of take away the, the nameless facelessness of sort of the, the grunt soldier as it will play sort of an important part. And G, it sort of ties back to G Gundam is sort of this like sportsman sportsmanship to war. And that's going to kind of come up sort of like nobility and civility in the face of war and kind of what does a mechanization of war do to 
uh, a humanity who a humanity that engages within it. Um, Certainly. So, so there we go. So now we can sort of we sort of picked apart the story structures there for a bit. We can go off to our segment the way we go. Uh, Bob, what did this sort of what did these episodes kind of make you think of this week? Uh, so, <clears throat> pardon. I, I do want to preface this uh, because I feel like I may or may not have gotten it out last time. Mm-hmm. I am currently watching both of these series in the Japanese language with English subtitles. If I'm understanding correctly, you, Scahill, are watching these series in English as yes. a dub, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. At some point, I do need to make time to at least see certain key episodes that, uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I remember us talking about this. You say that there's some weird reads in the first handful of episodes for Wing. Yeah, I think around, I think I was thinking about it last night. I think it's going to be around episode seven or eight or so that is sort of a, a chunk of the cast, specifically two or three people, kind of change a lot and kind of really get in a groove. Well, with that said, uh, I do wonder how much of it is going to be due to um, whether or not the voice actors got a chance to know how certain phrases might come up more. I think about how the Japanese read for I'll kill you Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the first episode and gets recapped at the beginning of the second sounds very different than the way that it was read in English with the uh, added weird music that I think they have only in the English version. Interesting. In the moment where uh, after he walks away, she's just kind of left standing there in shock. Uh, There, there are a lot of, uh, what 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 is the term I'm looking for here? My brain is just dead. Uh, uh, a lot of not liabilities, but uh, when somebody is taking something, uh, they're uh, allowing themselves a taking, help me out here. Taking scale. what? Taking anything? Liberty? Uh, when when somebody is uh, taking liberties, that's okay. the word I was looking for. Uh, uh, in the '90s and early 2000s. Uh, American dubbing groups took a lot of liberties with adding on different music, adding in uh, ad libs here and there where they felt like there was going to be too much quiet and not enough voice acting. It's the same reason why when you watch Power Rangers, they don't shut up. (laughs) There are a lot of times where they're like not saying anything during a fight and they're not overexerting themselves. That is purely an American response to all this. So I don't know if it's Americans such as myself like to just hear themselves talk a lot mm-hmm. and hear other people talking to fill in the gap of space and sound to make it feel not awkward for them. So that's that's my preface going in. Now to what you asked uh, in the uh, G Gundam episode, it was very much a chance for us to start seeing other people with dreams and aspirations in a way that isn't in the same darkness that we find Domon pressing forward. We're going to see some more characters really soon that are going to be of import. Again, you'll be able to tell because of colors of hair and the way that they interact with people. Uh, But Chibity is just this, for all intents and purposes, great representation of a regular American guy. He started from the bottom and then he clocked people until somebody noticed and they were like, hey, we'll train you so that way you can make sure that we stay president of space. Uh, Compare that to us getting to see Duo Maxwell. Duo Maxwell is a terrifying individual when you consider how excited he is to just literally be an emissary of death on everybody. Killing people underwater under immense levels of pressure. We just see people dying. And he's got the smile like, yeah, I'm doing it. It's honestly horrific compared to, I'm a guy inside a triple transforming (laughs) representation of my country. I'm going to punch you in the face. Comparatively speaking, that's two very different tones right now. The progression of G Gundam is that it's trying to build up momentum towards uh darker themes and this grandiose plot it is melodramatic but in a way that is because of the way they've set up the world very palatable comparing this to Gundam Wing where we've already seen that there is this at least in my opinion disconnect between the levels of melodrama we have 
spy intrigue. We have giant robots. We have war. And we have some weird, like, romance, teenage drama thing going on. We have four levels of things coming at us simultaneously. Comparing this to a very other well-known uh, giant featured series, uh, Neon Genesis Evangelion, uh, we at least get pacing. Some episodes focus just on uh, the fights. Some episodes just really focus on the meaning behind the fights. Some focus on the trauma of these kids. Wayne is just slapping you left and right with all of it. Yeah, Wing is clearly, you know, we talked about it last episode. It's a very cramped show. Um, and that's why they had to sort of make all these other things to go with it to tell the whole story. And it, there's really like a 30, 30 year time period that you kind of focus on, but we only really get to exist in this year and then sort of the next year for the movie. Um, and then, of mm. course, there's all, you know, the 30 years happens all in the prequel and in the manga adaptation. So, yeah, they are definitely sort of trying to overburden themselves with how much they want to do. And I wonder why they felt the need to sort of do so much but it does sort of I, at least to me it, it kind of helps pay off later on like i imagine g gundam will as well my thing is bob sort of my thing this week is sort of thinking back or going back to voice acting with you listening to the english dubs of both of these uh, i don't have a problem like a lot of anime people where like i the dub doesn't sound great so i don't want to watch it um i sort of can tolerate things but i can definitely tell when a dub has less effort put into it Mm. And this G Gundam seems to just sort of be they, they the voices are somewhat bland um, and hard to distinguish. Um, the audio quality isn't even really great, um, and it, it felt like they were just like, "All right, come and read your lines. Don't worry about getting too inflective. Just say the them." The early and then episodes let's go are on. very much like that, and I just wonder, like, you know, especially since you know these two shows came out pretty close together, and even the other Gundam shows that they were sort of translating or dubbing afterwards sort of kind of go closer to wing where it seems like somebody's at least trying. Um, why do you think, I guess, how would this, why would you think this was happening at this time period in, in the voice acting world? Like why would a show like G Gundam not really get that much effort in my mind put in, you know, in my words, put into it. So I think what they're trying to do early on is to make sure that it seems serious enough albeit that's obviously a not incredibly serious series but we're also in the early years of dubbing as far as a consistent level of anime dub up to this point you had your hiccups here and there with some series like you had your dragon ball dragon ball z you had your um sailor moon and a few other series but either they overham it in some places, like the dub for Sailor Moon, or it's something that has had so many years to build up story that you can get a bunch of scripts at once instead of having to wait to get all the scripts from something that only aired last year or mm -hmm. what have you. So with something where you're trying to catch up with a series during this period of the late 90s and early 2000s, you're having people learning a completely new industry and trying to not make it mechanical, but try to make it um, rapid fire. They're starting to see how kids are starting to get into this. And so they need to churn them out. They need to get out their Gundam. They need to get out Yu Yu Hakusho. They need to get out Tenchi Muyo. They're trying to get as much content out as they can to the point where some series just say, to hell with the script. <laughs> I'm looking at, uh, uh, what was it, like ghost stories or I don't know, whatever. I don't know what that is. Yeah, I think it was called ghost stories, but it, it was supposed to be like a sort of paranormal series. Okay. But it became a comedy series, and they used a lot of words that we would not want to use <laughs> in today's languaging. Uh, you know, a lot of terminology that uh, is base. But uh, people loved it for the time, and those people that watched it then still love it now because they have a fondness for what the uh, dubbing cast did, which was just lay into it. If you look at Excel Saga, it's over the top, so over the top, but people love it because the show already meets that flavor. We don't quite get to that point of over the top yet in G Gundam. Mm -hmm. As the story goes, it's going to feel a lot more like Dragon Ball Z's dubbing would be at the time. Yeah for you watching the English. Yes. For me watching the Japanese, uh, the pacing and the the tone for each of the characters is pretty 
on par for how they're depicting the characters. And like I said last week, an American dub artist, uh, a person who is uh, dubbing over these things, has to do the acting, has to match the lip flap, which is a, a precision-based thing, and they have to try and impart some of what the initial voice actor did while still making it their own, which is difficult to say, is this too much like them? Did I not get enough of them? Do I have enough of me in here to show my skills for another character down the line? I'm going to take that and I'm going to flip it on you. Chibity Crockett's voice actor in Japanese. Yes. Right. He is a very successful voice actor in Japan. He is uh, one of the standby voices for very famous uh, actors. Ray Liotta, Jeff Goldblum, uh, Tim Robbins. He is regularly cast to dub for them in many of their most well-known uh, roles. Uh, he is prolific. He's been all over the place. He's even been in uh, several Gundam series, including Zeta Gundam, Double Zeta, uh, a slew of them down the line. He has also been uh, in some of my Toku series, uh, most well-known as Deneb. Uh, a character from Kamen Rider Denno, one of the most successful franchises in Kamen Rider's history, and for the longest time was the most successful in their history. Yeah, so I guess, that, you know, I, I, I do, when I get a show, I generally watch it in English, and then I'll also watch it in Japanese, mostly to see uh, what translation things they're doing. Um, yeah. The Japanese voice actors always seem fine. I can't tell for, for certain, because I don't fully know how their speech patterns work and things, but I, it, I know that they take their voice actors more seriously to the point where... Uh, you know, the characters in sequels to the original Gundam can't show up in the sequels because the voice actors aren't available or dead, so they just don't put them in there. Yeah. Um, because uh, the audiences won't settle for somebody that's not that voice actor, which is sort of a, a different thing that w than we, we do in America. So, But I'm just wondering, because you sort of brought up that it sort of is in the benefit of the voice actors, the dub artists here, to sort of do a really great job to help get more work. So why are these dubs sort of like lifeless? Is it a sort of a director, uh, you know, going for a weird effect? Or is it, uh, you know, actors that just are really cheap and, and thus not good? Like what's sort of going on here in, in, in this G Gundam English dub early on? It is very much like its own golden age uh, where if you go back to the golden age of original animation with your Bugs Bunnies and what have you, you had a handful of people who were mostly takeovers from radio drama mel blanc one of the most well-known voice actors in history if you've listened to the original bugs bunny daffy duck what have you anything from looney tunes uh 90 of the voices were his mm -hmm. male or female uh what wasn't his were june foray and a number of other uh voice actors and actresses uh but it was a very tight crew it's slowly getting to be a larger more uh accommodating crowd uh and at this point not a whole lot happens in dub because you have people that don't want to try and have to match the lip flap so you're getting people who are trying to get into the industry while also getting into modeling or stage okay. acting film acting trying to use this as a way to supplement their uh uh finances they're doing so with the guidance of whatever director is able to get onto that script. And at that time, everybody's just trying to figure out how to do it best. So it's still, uh, it's bubble gum instead of duct tape. You know, it's people are just trying to figure out what works first and then they smooth it out after the fact. It's the difference between voice acting in 2000 versus 2010 versus now. Okay. You know, those mm -hmm. are three different eras, yeah. three very different styles of read. All right. Well, that was interesting. All right, Bob. So we're getting close to the end of our show. Would you like to come over here and join me in the nerd corner? Sure. So my nerdy thing this week, and it's it's extremely nerdy. Mm -hmm. So since the, the quarantine has been happening, you know, a lot of theaters and places are shut down. One place is the one such place is the Metropolitan Opera in New York. And so for the last few months, they've been, you know, each day they'll they'll put out one of their old streams of an opera that they usually mm -hmm. record and then put into a movie theater. Um, and, and I got to see one of these in the movie theater in November called Akhenaten, and it was a very great, uh, a great opera by the incomparable Philip Glass. And they have oh. finally put it, they finally streamed it last week 
Um, so I got to watch it again. Usually they'll put these things out on Blu-ray, but for some reason, Philip Glass doesn't let them do it. They also did another of his operas, Satyagraha, which was about sort of Gandhi, um, uh, you know, back at the beginning of the decade. And that still hasn't been released. I don't know why. So it's been hard to kind of find these things and watch them, but they put both up this weekend. I watched them both. They are still both fantastic and i recorded them from the stream so now i can watch them over and over again they're really great shows the director of bo- is the same on both of those productions even though the nine years apart but they're just fantastic and sort of absurd somewhat absurd and fit really well with sort of what philip glass does with his music and the singers are all fantastic as well what uh what have you found this week bobo i found that i have a crippling addiction to cardboard <laughs> uh, oh yeah yeah, so uh, at the behest of you per our conversation last week, I did purchase the rest of uh, the cards needed to build a legacy burn deck for Magic the yes. Gathering. Besides which, I've also purchased several cards for both a zombie and a vampire deck in the commander format. Uh, but the zombies might find their way into my mill deck, so it might be a, a zombie mill now. You know the one I've been trying to build uh, with. Yeah, I uh, think are they just that Jumpstart put out a whole bunch of mill stuff. I think you should go full hard on that, full ham on uh, that. So nobody was doing singles. I, I go to Card Kingdom. Yes, CardKingdom.com. Not sponsored. Please sponsor. Uh, but I have been waiting for them to put up the singles because they've been waiting until they could actively get closer to release of the sealed product to then be okay to open a bunch of packs themselves and start feeding their own machine, you know? Mm-hmm. So, uh, cause I want to get at least one, if not a few of the, uh, elf that just came out. That is blue hate. Uh, this elf can't be countered. Other elves can't be countered. Uh, screw you. I'm green. I want it so badly. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, so as you hear me over here, I'm talking about all these pieces of, I have a few over here pieces of cardboard i probably have between the chaff and the good stuff at least a few thousand cards and uh i have sleeves i just bought a bunch more sleeves i'm waiting on uh some more boulders for the decks that will be used on the regular it's it's its own paper cut filled hell and (laughs) i love it but i've realized that i've gone too far and i am putting the brakes on card purchases for the foreseeable future. Sounds reasonable. All right. That sort of brings us to the end of the episode. Bob, would you like to do your plugs? Uh, Sure. Uh, My plugs include, uh, if you were to want to find me uh, on the internet, you can find me on Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, and the like by just going to those websites and searching Bob Scary VOA. That's B O B S K E. R-R-Y-V-O-A. And should you want to hire me, you can go to my website, bobscaryvoa.com, or find me on voices.com. Please, for the love of all that is good, if you've enjoyed listening to my voice on this uh, podcast thus far, hire me for anything. I will do a voice for your uh, home game RPG. I will do a voice for you to send to a loved one. I will do you a voice just because you want to throw money away. Throw it at me, though. Bob Scary, VOA. And I am always in your inimitable Patrick Scale. Uh, you can find my feature shorts animations at quixoticunited.com. There are probably social medias there visible there too. Uh, all right, Bob, say good night to the night, nice folks. Thank you all for listening. Good night to the nice folks. Thank you for listening. All right, and Bob, for my for my personal benefit, will you sing me a little of the Team America theme song? America, fuck yeah! I I don't remember any of this song. <laughs> America, fuck yeah! Yeah, I think that will do fine. <laughs>